Chapel Podcast. Well, the Bible says the wicked will be cut off, and I've already been prejudged, but our speaker has not. He is uh, full size. And there's a reason for that. He's the, he's the height I always dreamed about, and God didn't fulfill my dreams. But uh, our t- today's chapel speaker is Ralph Drollinger, who is the president of Capital Ministries in Sacramento, California. Ralph was the first player in NCAA history to go to the Final Four tournament as a player four years in a row. Because he played from 1972 to 1976 under the legendary coach John Wooden at UCLA. Sensing God's call into ministry, he turned down professional basketball contracts with several NBA players to play with athletes in action. And for years, they traveled the world and preached the gospel at the half times of their games. During those years in sports ministry, Ralph saw how God could reach an entire people group, like athletes around the world, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1997, he sensed the need to begin a different people group ministry, and that's with politicians. He now serves as a ministry leader for the California State Capitol and is currently working with numerous elected officials. He has weekly Bible studies with legislators, staff, and lobbyists. But he's developing a ministry example in California with a vision to train and place 50 skilled ambassadors for Christ, one in each state capital of our country in the coming years. He resides in Santa Clarita Valley with his family. His wife is Danielle, who's here. Danielle, would you stand so that we could acknowledge you? Thank you for being here. They have three children, John, Susan, and Scott, and one grandson, John Andrew. Would you welcome with me to our platform this morning, Ralph Drollinger. Uh, Mark forgot a passage there, Romans 3.23, which says, Some have sinned and fallen short. (laughs) Sorry, that's bad exegesis, isn't it? (laughs) Well, I'm delighted to be here. A little of the introduction that was not said. After my time with Athletes in Action, I was a free agent, and I signed with the Dallas Mavericks with the hopes of going to this seminary. I was actually recruited by about four NBA teams, and it was the first Dallas Maverick back in 1980. And uh, rather than spend time in the classroom, I spent more time in the whirlpool. And uh, (laughs) Dr. Hendricks, I don't know if you still do it, but he ran our our Bible study with the Mavericks and the the Cowboys together. So those were always great times, and I still remember some of your uh, topics that you taught on in 1 Peter. Well, I uh, am delighted to be here this morning because This is uh, one of my childhood dreams, was to go to school here. I ended up going back to California after I was retired prematurely by the Mavericks and uh, (laughs) went to get my seminary degree out there. And I'm just delighted to be here to talk about partnering with your seminary and trying to put 50 men in 50 capitals. We have presently, I think, about 20, if not on the ground in respective states, uh, in training. Don Garner, I think, is here, who's going to Austin. Don, are you around? He might, oh, there he is, right in the middle. Uh, Don looks like a Texan, doesn't he? So uh, we're grateful that he and Tracy are uh, heeding the call to ministry in your wonderful state capitals. It's actually probably one of the most difficult state capitals in terms of indexing it ministerially uh, because you have a real short session in a really large state, which means our guy is going to have to be pretty much a traveling evangelist to really do a job of disciple-making. And what I want to talk about this morning is the whole uh, presupposition of evangelicalism's approach to the uh, political arena these last 30 years and what has commonly been referred to by the secular media as the religious right movement. And is that a proper dial-in by we evangelicals to that particular people group? My answer is no. And what I'd like to do is take you through a bit of a study this morning from Scripture that shows the biblical mandate to evangelize and disciple political types not just moralize them, if there is a place for that. You can't expect, and this is, Dr. Hendricks will like this because it's kind of nice and tight. You can't expect someone who rejects the author of scripture to accept the precepts of his book. 
And therein is a huge flaw in the notion of evangelicalism trying to moralize political leaders, 7,500 of them from the state level and up, to try to get them to vote biblically. Because if there's no Ephesians 2 uh, idea of the, uh, the death of sin in the heart of the person without Christ, then you can't really accept them, expect them to accept anything in the holy book, right? And so what I'd like you to see this morning, if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'd like to jump in here and look at, as you turn there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When I was in sports ministry, if I can give you somewhat of a pragmatic approach to what I want to talk about, when I was in the sports ministry, what we'll call the sports ministry movement, uh, I saw from my purview of heading up a trade organization of all of America's sports ministries, uh, there being about 84 of them in a para sense, uh, apart from just local church evangelistic sports ministry, that the most effect we were having in the sports ministry movement in America was that of putting a full-time disciple maker on high school teams, college teams, and pro teams. And uh, that was really churning out a lot of fruit. Matter of fact, if you talk to someone in FCA, the oldest uh, sports ministry in America, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, back in the 50s, they'd say there's probably one or two athletes in the whole of the country that could articulate their faith in Christ. And today there's literally thousands, aren't there? It's hard to go a week in national or local media, electronic or print, and not hear some athlete spout off about his faith in Christ. Well, that didn't just happen. It was really the result of uh, a growing sports ministry movement that has now probably over a thousand, if not more, full-time sports ministers fueling that. And so my wife, who was a recovering religious right addict who used to work for some ministry in Colorado Springs, <laughs> she said, why don't we do the same thing to political types that you've been doing to sports type. So off to Sacramento we went. It turned out there was a person up there who was retiring looking for a replacement. And we founded Capital Ministries about 12 years ago. And the, the genesis of that has been to build a model there and then export it into all the other capitals. And now we're up to, I think, about 20 when you consider those that are in training. And so when you look at the sports ministry movement, you can see an exemplar or a parallel of what we're trying to do in the political arena. For starts, if we could find 50 of you that would beckon a call to go into a state capital, particularly from a state where you're at, understand the culture, that we could put uh, a fueling of a biblically-based discipleship ministry amongst our, our political types. And we all lament the fall of American culture, but I don't think we've done the most biblically germinating thing to correct that, that free fall. And so if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, you'll notice that Paul says to Timothy, who's pastoring at Ephesus, right? He says, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil, a, lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This, and the antecedent there to this, would be the evangelistic praying. This evangelistic praying is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, here's the question I have of the text, just to look at this, if we can click on this box for a second. Why does Paul make such an abrupt jump switch in the context of 1 Timothy? After all, he just got done in verse 20 of chapter 1, excommunicating Hymenaeus and Alexander. And so why does he all of a sudden now, in the Greek it reads uh, parakaleo protos, which parakaleo is a compound, it's uh, first person, singular, present, active, indicative, which means, I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> He's basically saying, I call kaleo alongside, that's where we get parachurch, right? Parakaleo, I call inferred you alongside inferred me, protos, which means priority in the sense of not sequence, but in terms of importance. I call you alongside of me in terms of importance in the church to be about evangelistic prayers of these four types, which we won't go into, in order to uh, evangelize not all men, but in specificity, in addition, kings and those who are in authority. So why does Paul suddenly say this should be the priority of 
the church, when he just gets or got done excommunicating Hymenaeus and Alexander, seems to be somewhat of a contextual difficulty to interpret what he means by this. And there's probably three postulations of this, not to spend a lot of time on them. But first of all, it could be that Paul, because he's a Pharisee, understands that it's normative for God's people, the Jews, to reach political types. This is called out people in the Old Testament. Uh, You see Moses and Joseph, Mordecai, Daniel, and Jonah alongside political types, so that's normative. He would think that it would be normative today for the church to do the same. A second thought would be that um, Hymenaeus and Alexander, as we see earlier in chapter one, are probably preaching a, a false doctrine of of uh, legalism mixed with Gnosticism, and it's probably an internalized church that's beating up on themselves with all kinds of internal difficulties, and herein he's saying the church needs to be more external. It needs to be about going outside of itself so as to solve its legalistic internal tendencies. But the third one, and I want to take you down a path here that I think Um, is my thought as to why this jump switch occurs, and I'm going to build this out in a second, is that Paul had been commissioned when he's going to Rome to stand before Caesar. And we see that in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, that he's called to evangelize in Rome. And this is before the the council that he's being... uh, brought before, and and he he says as much. And in chapter 27, verse 23, an angel appears to him. He's on the shipwreck journey now, headed to Rome. And the angel says to him, what? He says, you're going to, uh, you're going to be saved. And all on the ship are going to be saved. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, it's because you need to stand before Caesar. So in 2311 and 2711, we know he's to evangelize and he's to evangelize before Caesar. We see evidence of this in Philippians, the jail epistle, because what's he say in Philippians 1, verse 13, that he is standing before the praetorian, he's brought the gospel to the praetorian, which are the inner circle around Caesar. And then in 422 of Philippians, what does he say? He says, the brethren of Caesar's household send you their greeting also. Where am I going? There's evidence here that Paul was prophesied by the angel to stand before Caesar and witness to him, but there's no account of such in Philippians. And so he probably struck out, much like I do with Arnhold in our capital. And so his, his knee-jerk response, his knee-jerk response is to say, we need to get the church evangelistically praying for political types. Well, this makes my case for capital ministries quite conveniently, doesn't it? that we need to have churches that someday you will pass, or maybe if you're on the staff of Capital Ministries, have a, a zealous commitment to parakaleo protos in terms of evangelizing political types. Now, this isn't something that's just new to the dispensation of the church age. If you look backwards for a second, we build this theme out throughout all of the scripture. We can see that in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, God tells us that Israel was to have as its mission uh, to be a nation uh, that kings would come to their brightness, the brightness of their witness. And we see this in the narrative passages, first, uh, first Kings chapter 10, as well as in Isaiah uh, or Second Chronicles chapter 32, respectively, the queen of Sheba and the rulers of Babylon both come to see Solomon's reign and are just awestruck by the glory of Israel. And Luke 11 would infer that the Queen of Sheba came to Yahweh as a result of that witness. And so in Israel's time, to take a step back and see this theme, in Israel's time, there was a definite purpose for God's people to be reaching political types with the good news, with Yahweh's glory. And we see this illustrated furtherly in a a corporate sense by First Kings, as I said, but also architecturally in terms of the temple. In the prayer for the dedication of the temple in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 11, Scripture says, your gates will be open continually so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. And so what's to be the court of the Gentiles relative to the architectural design of the temple was a place of conversion, not only of just the Gentile people in general, but their kings as well who were to lead those Gentile nations in procession. 
Obviously, Israel was set apart to be God's chosen people as a witness to the other Gentile nations, the other descendants of Noah. And then we see this not only corporately in the Old Testament, not only architecturally in the Old Testament, but we see it missiologically as well relative to the the book of Jonah. Jonah takes Yahweh's glory to the king of Nineveh who repents and comes to faith. And so that's a theme that's redundant throughout the Old Testament. We see it in the time of Christ in Matthew 10, verse 18. Turn there with me, if you will, because I want to look at this same theme now as we gallop forward. And when Jesus sets apart the 12 disciples in Matthew 10, notice that in verse 18 the specificity of political types. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as what? As a testimony to them. So not only do we see it in the time of Israel, we've just seen it in the church age, we've just seen it in the time of Christ. How about the apostolic era? Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Acts 9, 15, we see the commissioning of Paul or the conversion, I should say, of Saul. And Ananias is God's surrogate to take the message to Saul as to why he's been blinded on the road to Damascus. And he is told in verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, Ananias, for he, that would be Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and what? and kings and the sons of Israel. So not only do we see this theme in the Old Testament, the time of Christ, the apostolic era, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, in the time of Christ, but we also see it in the tribulation period. Look at Mark 13, 9. Similar language to the Matthew passage, but now in a future eschatological sense, of the tribulation period, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And then not to look this passage up, but in the uh, book of Revelation, you see the noun for rain, and, or the, the, the verb for rain, and the noun for king is the same in the Greek, meaning that when we... Uh, are in the millennial kingdom under the king of kings, we will become kings who reign with him. So that's kind of a nice icing on the cake for this bit of a study on this topic. And so what am I saying here? We see a biblical mandate, here's my proposition, probably should have started with this. We see a biblical mandate throughout scripture for us as evangelicals to be reaching political types with the gospel. You're on shaky ground as a pastor if you're trying to lead your flock into shaping the next election cycle. But you're on really strong biblical grounds if you're about evangelizing and discipling the political types in your region, your state, your local community. And so the vision of Capital Ministries is not only to put 50 men and 50 capitals, but then to, that's kind of like third base on our our thinking. to to stem down with associate staff from churches that could do Bible studies in local city, county government buildings, as well as when we get to 30 capitals, uh, my board has said we can make a move on DC and then go international. So we hope to uh, take the gospel in an unadulterated sense and really teach the word of God throughout uh, government in our world. And so that's what you can uh, think about in terms of your own calling, if God might be calling you to such a ministry as this or in your own church to partner with us because we're not some whirling dervish parachurch ministry that's out of control and doesn't have the local church at our heart. Uh, That's not our way of thinking. And so I would ask you to uh, consider this. Uh, My father-in-law is here and my mother-in-law is here, so I have to act really good. And they're manning the booth over in the student center. And so if you're interested at all in capital ministries, come see us. And they'll be around, I think, all day to uh, talk more about what I've said. We're uh, just delighted to see how this affects the lives of of politicians. We just had a legislator last year come to Christ through our Colorado ministry. We had a legislator come to Christ through our Virginia ministry. I've had a legislator in California 
who's been part of my staff ministry. He started there 12 years ago when we started the ministry, and he went back to Fresno because he wanted to run for office, and uh, he won election in Fresno, and then two years ago became the minority leader of the assembly, which meant that he had a lot of power, one of the most five powerful people in the state. And because he has been so uh, strident, if that, that's probably not the right word, but he's been so strong in his convictions regarding stewardship that he forced the governor with his vote of blocks or, or a block of votes to make sure that no, uh, no deficit budget would get out. And that's the first one I've seen in 12 years. And so you can see not only how a disciple for Christ in the political arena has a, a profound effect on his personal life, his familial life, but also on his vocational life. And uh, he gets to speak every day at a different meeting, and he can weave his testimony into his presentation. So these are men and women of tremendous influence in our culture that we need to be about as a church making disciples as we see specific throughout Scripture. And so that's our passion, and that's what we are striving singularly to be about doing. We just had another legislator come to Christ three months ago in our uh, new start of our ministry in Illinois. That was through a local church. But this guy's headed for Congress. I tell our uh, ministry leaders, if we just had each of you in the next 20 years turn out three disciples in the state capitol that ended up in D.C., which is kind of like home plate on their career path, just think of the, the tremendous influence that would have in our nation that eclipses anything of the last 30 years because you'd have men and women with visceral convictions that are biblically based thinking through things that you wouldn't have to pressure them on at all because they just think biblically because they've been taught by a man of God in their respective capital, in their respective locale at a younger age. So thanks for uh, listening to me today as I've taken you on a quick journey, uh, a water ski journey across the top of Scripture on this uh, specific subject. It's there, it's explicit. We just need to be obedient to it. Do I get to close in prayer or what's this? Great, thank you chaplain. And I didn't have to wipe off the podium from your trumpet. (laughs) They do that at Mount Hermon, you know. That's that's where I saw Dr. Swindoll with paper towels after Chaplain Bill. (laughs) I thought, should I bring paper towels? I asked Dr. Bailey if I should bring paper towels. (laughs) Father, thank you for the uh, clarity of your scripture as it pertains to reaching political types with the good news. It's a matter of our obedience, and we ask you to stir our hearts in that regard. First of all, that we wouldn't think of political types negatively. After all, they're often unregenerate. After all, they're often immature in Christ if they are born from above. But Lord, we just confess that we've been remiss in our duties to make disciples amongst this people group. And we ask that you would raise up an army of believers who would have this call on their hearts, placed there by yourself, a strategic partnership with this seminary for the years ahead that would find the young called out ones for such a task as this, not only in America, not only in Washington, D.C., but worldwide. And Lord, unless you build a house, we labor in vain. And so we look to you in humility, asking you to raise up an army that would reach this people group with the love and joy and the saving grace of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.